We're going to talk about quantum mechanics and eventually um, how this relates to uh, electron configurations and orbital notations. Okay, so the idea here is to gain a better understanding of how um, the position of electron is determined about in, in an atom. Okay. So Louis de Broglie posited that if light can have material properties, then matter should exhibit wave properties. And he demonstrated that that relationship between mass and a wavelength was represented by this equation, where the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant or Planck's constant, uh, which is 6.3 times 10 to the negative 34th, oh dear, negative 34th uh, joule seconds. Sorry about the pen not working very well. Over at mass versus velocity, which is the momentum of the piece of matter. Right? If this mass is a um, object like a table or a chair or a person, if you want to consider those all masses, this mass is going to be very large um, compared to, to Planck's constant, uh, which would make the wavelength to be very small. If so, if, if the mass is large, then lambda is small and the wave properties of matter are insignificant compared to the material properties. Okay, and that's so all matter has wave properties. However, if the mass is large enough, those wave properties are insignificant and really aren't um, observable. Okay. Now, just touching base on the uncertainty principle a little bit more, Heisenberg showed that the more precisely the momentum of a particle is known, the less precisely is its position known. I kind of like this discussion because it does relate to um, uncertainty. Okay. So the uncertainty okay, of the whereabouts of an electron, this delta x, okay, sometimes the uncertainty is greater than the size of the atom itself. So basically the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says you can know where an electron is likely to be found, but if you know its location, you don't know anything about its speed. And conversely, if you know anything about its speed, you can't determine anything about its location. And that is simplified terms. Okay. So quantum mechanics, which is the latest model of the atom and how the electrons are arranged around the nucleus, comes from Erwin Schrodinger, who developed a mathematical treatment in which both the wave and the particle nature of matter could be incorporated. Typically what you would see is some kind of a scatter dot diagram like this um, with the 3D axes and what these dots represent is really the probability of where an electron is likely to be found. Okay. This whole model is known as quantum mechanics. Schrodinger's equation looks like this. Okay. Um, these are his wave functions and it's defined over space and time. Those of you taking calculus, this would be a, a partial derivative with respect to time um, and wave functions. Okay. You don't need to know much about it. I just wanted to show you what it looked like. It's interesting. Um, but when you solve these wave equations and you square that wave equation, we get a probability density map of where an electron is likely to be found. And that's what this is. Okay. Um, so all these dots represent where a electron probably is. Okay, and then you draw a surface around that, keeping in mind that this is 3D, so this is a sphere, and it represents where an electron is likely to be found. Okay. 
So, we're going to look at what are called quantum numbers. Quantum numbers are a set of four numbers. that describe a unique electron in an atom. Okay. So no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. And we'll look at what, how these quantum numbers are actually related to electron configuration and a uh, orbital notation. Okay. It's not needed that you memorize what these quantum numbers are and what they mean, but I did want to give you a, an appreciation that they exist and that they are related to Schrodinger's equation. So, if we solve the, the wave equation, we get a set of wave functions or orbitals and their corresponding energies. And each orbital describes the spatial distribution of electron density. And then this orbital is defined, described by a set of three quantum numbers. The fourth qu quantum, numbers, quantum number differentiates between the two electrons that would be found in an orbital. And we'll get to what these actual shapes of the orbitals are in just a little bit. The first number, the quantum number, the principal quantum number, um, represented by an n, is also commonly referred to as the main energy level. So this describes the main energy level on which the orbital resides. The values of n are integer integers greater than or equal to 1. For the modern periodic table, oops, I don't know why I did that. Okay, we have quantum number, principal quantum numbers one through seven. Theoretically, the main energy levels go up to infinity, but on the periodic table, we only need up to seven. Next is the angular momentum quantum number, which is L. Okay, and this defines the shape of the orbital. Allowed values of L are integers ranging from 0 to n minus 1. And again, is the principal quantum number. And we use these letter designations to communicate the different values of L, which really is the shapes and the types of the orbitals. There are four types of orbitals. S, P, D's, and F's, corresponding to L0 through 3. Theoretically, again, these go higher, but these are what is needed to describe the periodic table. Okay. But theoretically, they do continue. And then there is the third quantum number, known as the magnetic quantum number, and that describes the three-dimensional orientation of a specific orbital. And the values of ML are integers from negative L to L. So if, as an example, if my ML is equal to 1, my L can be equal to either 1 or 0 or minus 1. So, there can be 1s orbital, 3p orbitals, 5d orbitals, 7f orbitals, 9g orbitals, and etc. because they do continue according to the alphabet after that point. This is an important table to know. N, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So for main energy levels 1 through 4, we have possible values of L. So for the first main energy levels, I can have an S. Really, we call them sublevels. 
for a shell. Okay, orbitals with the same value of n form a shell. For the second main energy level, I have a 0 or a 1 for L. That's the S and the P sublevel. Okay, we typically would have called these sublevels. Okay, and you can see this designation here. For the third one, S, P, D, and then for the fourth, I have to add that fourth. Possible values of ML, you can see here. Now, what did they correspond to? Typically, um, when we're writing it, we would correspond this to a PX, a PY, or a PZ. And we'll see what those mean in just a moment. Number of orbitals in each of these subshells. For the first one, there's one. For a P sublevel, there are three orbitals. For a D, there are five, and for an F, there are seven. Okay. Each orbital can have a maximum of two electrons. Okay. And each, um, if you add up the orbitals, you get these numbers here. I kind of threw in the two electrons per orbital. And we'll see, hopefully this will all fit in um, in just a moment. Okay. We look at S orbitals. The value of L, okay, or that angular momentum quantum number for an S orbital is zero. These are spherical in shape. The radius of the sphere increases with the value of n. Remember, the lowest energy levels are closest to the nucleus. As I go farther out, my main energy number is increasing, and the sphere gets larger or farther from the nucleus. It's interesting to note I'm th you're not responsible for this, but it's interesting to note that if you look at the actual probabilities of where you're going to find an electron versus distance from the nucleus, so that's what these graphs are, probability of where the electron is going to be and the distance from the nucleus. Okay, in the first 1s, okay, th there's a peak of where you're going to find the electron, um, and it gets... Um, less likely the farther we are from a um, real far from the nucleus. If you notice the probability of where we're going to find the electrons that are in the 2s sublevel, you notice that there is a dip in this. Roughly corresponds to where the electrons are likely to be found in the first main energy level. And that makes sense, or I should say in the first 1s sublevel. It makes sense because if the electrons here are likely to be found here, the electrons in another sublevel are not likely to be found there. Those are called nodes, and these nodes are regions where there is zero probability of finding an electron. As I go up in main energy levels for these different sublevels, that you, you start adding nodes. And again, roughly in the location of where the electrons in the previous sublevel are likely to be found. Again, just I thought it was an interesting thing to note. All right, if we talk about a P sublevel, okay, the value of the angular momentum is 1. Okay, these P sublevels have two lobes with a node in between them, okay, of where the electron is likely to be found. And these are, I'm sorry, going back to the D's for just a second. These are oriented along the X, the Y, and the Z axes. Okay, we typically kind of draw them as a figure eight or two peanuts in a peanut shell. In reality, the electron density probability looks like this. Moving on to the P orbitals. You notice most of these are look like four-leaf clovers, with the exception of the DZ2 orbital, and that kind of looks like a P sublevel with a donut around them. <coughs> you should have an idea at this level what a D orbital looks like. Okay, Four leaf clovers oriented about different um, planes about the nucleus, and then um, a P orbital with a donut. The F orbitals, just to throw it in, look like these. Um, 
don't you don't need to know the shapes of these. It's just um, interesting to see what the probability of the electron densities are as we go up in sublevels. Okay. Energy of these orbitals. For a one electron hydrogen atom, orbitals on the same energy level have the same energy, called degenerate. Okay. For a one electron hydrogen atom, that's what these energies would look like. Again, the term is called degenerate. They're degenerate energy levels, meaning they're at the same energy level. Okay. Unfortunately, it doesn't follow that simple rule as the number of the electrons increase. Because these electrons have repulsive forces, okay, they kind of change how the orbitals are in relationship to energy level. So the 2s sublevel is actually lower in energy than a 2p. The 3s is lower than a 3p. Here's where it's kind of very different in that the 4s sublevel is actually lower in energy than a 3d. And if we can follow the patterns given on the periodic table, the order of filling of the sublevels um, I think becomes a little easier to follow a pattern. In the 1920s, we, the fourth quantum number was discovered, um, and it's called the spin quantum number, and it has to do with actually the um, magnetic field or the electrical field that the two electrons in an orbital exhibit. Those two electrons do not have exactly the same energy. It's the spin, or describing its magnetic field, that affects the energy of those two electrons in that orbital. And again, that's the fourth quantum number, the spin quantum number. And those can only have two values, either plus a half or a minus a half. And it really describes um, a characteristic of the magnetic field of those two electrons. Okay. So take a moment, pause, answer these questions. We'll come back. Okay, so for this first question, hopefully you took a moment to answer it. Um, don't worry about this. That doesn't have anything to do with your book. Um, predict the number of subshells in the fourth shell, that is for n equals 4. Well, if n is the main energy level, and it's equal to 4, then there are 4 subshells or sub-energy levels present. If we were to give a label for each of these subshells, the first one would be a 4s, 4p, 4d, and 4f. How many orbitals? There's 1, 3, 5, and 7. And hopefully you can see a pattern with that. The next screencast will talk about um, electron configurations and how electrons uh, fill in these main energy levels and subshells.